Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Leah pappas Porner. I am a partner with the Calfi Law Firm, and I am honored to be joined by my partner, Blake Beachler, who chairs our public finance practice. But our great guest today is the treasurer of the state of Ohio, Robert Sprague. Thank you for joining us. We really appreciate the time and uh, your future comments in this webinar. Thank you so much for this morning. Thank you very much, Leah. Uh, looking forward to seeing you again soon in person, not just via Zoom, but this technology is fantastic. Uh, Leah, of course, is a force of nature in Columbus, and it's a great honor to be with you this morning. And looking forward to answering your questions. Uh, Blake, thanks for joining us from uh, Cleveland and looking forward to answering your questions as well. As we get started here, I just wanted to first of all say thank you to John Mino as well. Uh, he's doing a great job in your DC office. Always enjoy being with John. He's got something interesting to say and a, an interesting perspective on things every time I talk with him. And uh, we, we truly are strong as Ohioans, and I think that it's our resolve that has led us to this wonderful recovery so far uh, in the state of Ohio. And we have a lot of opportunities ahead. Uh, there will be some belt tightening. We just saw from OBM, we've got about a $2.4 billion reduction in revenues. Uh, that's actually real money, even for the state of Ohio. And so there's going to be difficult decisions along the way, but the treasurer's office is leading on that. We've cut our budget already by 20% for this fiscal year. And then the next fiscal year, which starts on July 1, we're looking for more cost savings. And so I'll talk about that uh, as you begin to ask me questions. And we'll talk about how we're saving and some of the innovative things that we're doing in the office. But so glad to be here with you today. Well, thanks for your time. I, uh, as I sit in our Columbus office and look over our beautiful state house, um, I am excited for the reopening of Ohio and, and everyone coming back down to our capital and, and uh, resuming the work that, that we do for our clients and uh, advocate for them. So with that, I'll jump into a very hot topic, which is the CARES Act. Mm -hmm. um, you know, many of us followed uh, what Congress was doing and watching as it, as it moved to the state. So as the CARES Act, Pitts, Ohio. Give us your opinion about at a local level and at a state level, you know, are we ready for the CARES Act money? Uh, is there enough flexibility around the use of the CARES Act money? Give us kind of your thoughts around that. Sure. Well, I think uh, the U.S. Treasury has issued guidance. We've received that guidance from the U.S. Treasury. Uh, and then we've received about $3.7 billion of cash from the U.S. Treasury uh, and, and in total is about $4.5 billion that came to Ohio. Some of it went directly to the bigger counties and bigger cities. The rest of it came to the state treasury for disbursement. Uh, and you'll notice that uh, Senate Bill 310, which uh, is at the State House now, I'm sure you're going over for some hearings on that later on this afternoon or tomorrow. Uh, but, uh, you know, that, that has some about $300 million of local CARES Act money that's going to be distributed to local governments. Here's the challenge for the CARES Act, is that when it was appropriated, Congress did it in a way as they responded to other disasters. So think Hurricane uh, Katrina, right? I mean, huge amount of additional activity. You're cleaning up trees, you're rebuilding roads, you're rebuilding houses, uh, a lot of marginal additional expenses. This crisis was not like that. It was everybody stay home. There weren't a lot of additional expenses. And yet when Congress appropriated that money for the CARES Act, they said it can only be spent on unbudgeted at the beginning of March, COVID related expenses. And so that's our challenge. We really need Congress to take the handcuffs off and let us use the money as we need to, to move our state forward and make the investments. And uh, quite honestly, some of the operational needs that we have as a state over the next two years, in addition to just the COVID related responses. So, to give you just an order of magnitude, you know, that Senate bill that we talked about is appropriating about $300 million. We have $3.7 billion sitting at the state treasury that the U.S. Treasury has already issued debt for, and they've sent us cash to, to, to do that. So I'm very pleased to be working with Congressman Warren Davidson. He has a very good uh, a bill. It's, I think, called like, a, you know, the Freedom, Restoring Freedom to Local and State Governments Act for the CARES money and basically takes a lot of those restrictions off and would allow us to use it for our needs as we move forward to get 
not just our not just to make sure that our localities are taken care of and our counties and our townships, but also then to be able to move our state forward economically. Maybe we should bring Congressman uh, Warren Davidson in and talk a little bit about his efforts there, right? Absolutely. And I think, and I don't want to like, you know, I think I'm sure the rest of the Ohio delegation is on board with that as well. But yeah, I think he'd be great. He's very, uh, he's very smart and Super very guy. thoughtful on the financial piece. Blake, did you have a question? Uh, yeah, Treasurer, you alluded to the, um, you know, the loss of tax revenue uh, for the state and um, also local political subdivisions, um, counties and, and cities with uh, the loss of income tax revenue, sales tax revenues, uh, et cetera, the list goes on. Um, how, do you, uh, how do you think that will affect the, um, the ability for those local political subdivisions to, you know, issue bonds or, or indebtedness to uh, finance uh, capital projects or, or other needed permanent improvements? Well, I think there's kind of three elements to that. The first is the revenue piece, which is what you've already talked about. Now, there's actually two different pieces of the revenue that you've got to think about. The first is the one-time shock. You know, we didn't collect a whole lot of sales tax in March. We didn't collect a whole lot of sales tax in April, right? But now that we're out of this and the economy is reopened, June, July, we're collecting much better sales tax, and you're starting to see those figures float back up to 85%, 90%, depending upon where you're at in the state of where they were before. So that one-time revenue hit could be filled with one-time money, like say some rainy day fund money, uh, and we can kind of go on. Now where we'd run into trouble in the longer term is when you have you know, reduction in revenues on a more permanent basis because of less economic activity. So if that bounce of sales tax or income doesn't get back up to that 100% level, you know, it only reaches 92% or whatever that is, that's where we're gonna run into trouble on down the road. And it's tough, quite honestly, to forecast that right now. Uh, that being said, do I think that municipalities or local governments are gonna have trouble accessing the debt market? My answer to you would be absolutely not. We actually went to market last week uh, with uh, I think about over $150 million issuance. Lisa Eisenberg led the transaction from our team. She did a phenomenal job. Um, and you're not going to believe this, but I mean, we got 1.4% on 15 year paper. It's just unreal. Wow. And one of the reasons for that, quite honestly, is that you're starting to see a stratification in the credit markets across the country, uh, not, not just in corporate debt, but also in the muni debt. And the strong, you know, there's a, there's a tremendous thirst and need for strong credit. And the state of Ohio is an extremely strong credit not just because of the underlying diversity of our, of our economy, which is one thing the credit ratings look at, but also because of the very low amount of debt service that we currently carry. You know, we're only at 4.7% of uh, GRF revenues, uh, which is by design in, in the constitution, but it's a lot lower than a lot of these other states that are you know, kind of comparable to us, whether it's California or Illinois or Michigan. And so people look at that and they say, wow, the state of Ohio's done a great job managing their debt rating. Now, your question was about localities, and I'm getting to that. And one of the reasons is because we have an Ohio market access program that we run out of the treasurer's office. So here's what we'll do for any local government. If they'd like to enter the credit market and they're going to issue a bond anticipation note, uh, we are willing to put the full faith and power of the state treasury behind that local government. So we essentially guarantee the repurchase of that into our investment portfolio. And the way the credit market looks at that uh, guarantee is that they're going to give that local municipality the same credit rating as the state of Ohio. And as credit spread widens, uh, there's going to be tremendous value in that Ohio market access program. And that's one of the things that's going to ensure us to be able to gain access for our localities in the state of Ohio uh, into the credit market. And let me just conclude that answer by saying we are actively actively looking at ways that we can help our local governments. That's something that's very personal to me, being former city auditor, city treasurer. I understand, I've seen this movie before, and I understand what municipalities and local governments are gonna face in this recession, because I was there during the great financial recession. And so one of our focuses in the treasurer's office has been and will continue to be in the future some innovative products. And uh, one of the things we're looking at right now is a cash management tool for local governments to be able to borrow against their future property tax receipts. So we're constantly trying to be innovative, 
That's a very innovative concept. It's a pooled product, very low cost of capital. Uh, so really excited about some of these ideas that we have on the, on the front burner. And, you know, and I can say with, uh, with personal experience, uh, working with the, the OMAP program, um, it, it's been, it's very user friendly and, and streamlined and uh, it's, it's really helped uh, some of uh, Calfi clients uh, get access to the market and, uh, and really get a lot of interest, interest cost savings. So uh, thank you for putting that program together and, uh, and uh, as you said, Lee Eisenberg, uh, does a great job with that program as well. Thank you, Blake. Thank you. We're so glad that you're a part of that. And we hope that not only will you, you know, continue to think about things like the Ohio Market Access Program, but also these new cash management tools as we begin to roll them out. Great, great. And those are mostly uh, local borrowings for short-term borrowings, I assume, one year. These are short-term borrowings, uh, absolutely, to help manage cash and liquidity flow for local governments. Uh, the interesting thing, thing about our, our counties and a lot of our local governments is they actually stand in a fairly strong cash position right now. But we think that as uh, the recovery wears on and we enter that kind of third phase, which is true economic recovery, um, that in the fall and the winter of next year into the spring and summer of next year, as those cash balances are depleted, there's going to be more and more of a need to manage uh, cash and liquidity through the balance sheet. And so we stand ready to help local governments with that. I'm sure. That's great. Um, I guess uh, on a similar vein, uh, recently, uh, when there was more turmoil in the markets, um, you guys, uh, the Treasurer's Office stepped up and, and really helped uh, a lot of the, the large hospital systems throughout Ohio uh, in purchasing uh, some of their outstanding variable rate demand uh, indebtedness. Uh, can you just briefly touch touch on that, uh, what, what the office did and, and how it helped? Yeah, absolutely. And this is something that we're always willing to do, which is put our $13 billion balance sheet to work for the people and the institutions of the state of Ohio. And early on, we had this huge credit market dislocation in March. And many of our hospitals in the state of Ohio, including the Cleveland Clinic and many other prominent hospitals, uh, finance a, a portion of their debt through variable rate demand notes, uh, which are auction based. They reset every week. In the third week of March, they saw that reset go from 1.3% to 8%. So their borrowing costs skyrocketed at the same time. And this was before the Federal Reserve really had stepped in and Jerome Powell had activated any of the powers that were passed by the CARES Act and in Congress. And so as the credit markets began this wild dislocation and people were searching as to what would provide liquidity, we said, look, we're gonna devote almost a billion dollars of liquidity into our hospitals. They are running toward the coronavirus. They are the people that are on the front lines of this. They're the people that are gonna help our state recover. And we don't want them to have to be looking over their shoulder uh, at the credit markets and wondering why the, their cost of capital is skyrocketing at the same time that they don't have any revenue because of the coronavirus. So we stepped in with almost a billion dollar facility. We immediately began uh, the purchase of this investment grade debt. Some of it was north of 8%. We bought it at two. And we figured that was a great deal for the taxpayers of the state of Ohio, 2%, really strong uh, hospital credit and much better than what we were getting in other pieces of our portfolio at that time. And at the same time, a huge help to these Ohio institutions that were helping our citizens get better from the coronavirus. Uh, and so we actually had one CFO that uh, I won't name, but he was up in your neck of the woods. And uh, Goldman Sachs actually didn't reset the auction that week, even though we stepped in and said, we're willing to buy it at 2%, they kept the rate at above six. And the CFO called Goldman and said, look, not only do I want my rate reset at 2% because we have a willing buyer, but you owe me a check for about $10 million. And he got it. So this wow. is big money for our hospital systems. And I think a huge help in also returning and using our balance sheet to restore stability to the credit markets in Ohio. Well, we certainly appreciate you stepping up and, uh, and helping, helping our local hospitals. That's, that's Thank great. You. Thank you. I do want to mention, uh, we've got a lot of qual quality people on our team, very innovative people, and John Azoff deserves a huge amount of credit 
He's a, a Clevelander, uh, and I want to mention John's work because I know you've worked with John, and he's yep. done such a great job with that program, very innovative. Treasurer, as you know, we are fortunate in Ohio to have so many wonderful financial institutions, mm -hmm. both small community banks and the large national banks and several headquartered right here in the great state of Ohio. When you look at our financial institutions, how have they fared through the pandemic and um, what has been kind of your interaction with them and any feedback that you have about them? Because, you know, many of us rely on their uh, employee base, uh, their community involvement and the great innovative work that they do uh, for the financial market. So uh, give us some reflection of, of how they're doing. Well, let me pick out uh, you know a very special player in the in the banking market up there in Cleveland is Key Bank, and they're special also to the state of Ohio. We have our depository actually for the state treasury with Key Bank, uh, and Key Bank has been fantastic. They help manage our liquidity during the crisis, and as a result, um, and we're constantly trying to build liquidity because we're running through about 150 million dollars a week uh, at the state that we're spending, and so we're always looking at our ladder. Uh, we're looking at our money market availability and always trying to you know, position ourselves from a, a place of strength and liquidity. We have almost, uh, I think, half a billion dollars now at Key. And there's a couple different reasons for that. And we've put money at a lot of the other Ohio banks and, and institutions. Um, and we, again, we freed up and, and we're prepared to do almost a billion dollars uh, in our Ohio lending institutions. Why? Because we know when we put deposits at a community bank, uh, maybe in my hometown of Finley or Cleveland or, you know, anywhere across the state, we know that those deposits eventually are going to help small businesses. Those are going to be the, that's the money that then the banks can loan out to small businesses to get our economy restarted. And why shouldn't we bring back our money from New York City and those securities and put it to work here in the state of Ohio so we can make those loans and get our economy back on track. So that was something that we did early on. And we really appreciate all of our banking partners and the financial institutions across the state. And I want to answer your question uh, directly. You know, what do you see in terms of the strength of our community banks and also some of the large uh, banking partners that we have across the state, Chase and Fifth Third and Huntington and Key, some of the biggest players, uh, PNC, some of the biggest players in the United States. I can tell you they are strong. This is a much different uh, financial situation than 2008, 2009, and 2010, which was really a financially induced economic recession. This is a demand shock. And clearly there's gonna be, you know, not all sectors are treated the same. I think we can all see that if you're an airline, uh, it's gonna be a yeah. tough road ahead, right? If you're in the hotel industry, I mean, I was talking with a, a financial institution. They said that some of our hotels are at 50% capacity, which they're thrilled about because they were at 10% earlier in the month. But even at 50%, uh, they're only able to command two thirds of the pricing that they were before the crisis. So there's a pricing problem along with an occupancy issue. So, you know, I mean, there's, there's credit risk out there. Obviously, there, you know, that's going to be difficult. A lot of our restaurants and some of the retail space and getting that open. But one of the things that you've seen our financial institutions do, both community banks and credit unions and our big, uh, large financial players, is they've all reduced their credit exposure to commercial real estate. And that's a good thing. And they also have a lot of liquidity that they've built up at the Federal Reserve uh, and a lot of reserves in, at the Federal Reserve. Uh, and the Federal Reserve has made dramatic changes thanks to Chairman Jerome Powell, who's done, by the way, a brilliant job of managing this crisis. Uh, they've changed a lot of the requirements for banks, so now that liquidity is freed up on their balance sheet, some of those reserves. So there's a lot of things that are happening behind the scenes that are you know, kind of more complex and technical that the Federal Reserve is doing to make sure that both our large lending institutions and our community banks and financial institutions can respond to this, and they're doing a great job. Uh, the final thing I'll say about this is, we had a terrific program that Congress enacted and that our banking system partners implemented, and it was the PPP program. I can tell you early on, I had my entire team looking at, look, I mean, how can we get small business back up and running? Is there a program that we could run out of the treasurer's office using our balance sheet 
to help with small business loans. And quite honestly, Congress came along and, you know, they've got a bigger balance sheet than I do. And plus they were offering loan forgiveness and, you know, they paid for payroll and mortgage expenses and in utilities for eight weeks. And we said, well, we can't compete with that. What we'll do is we'll just pile on and make sure that, that everybody knows about it. And so our regional liaisons went out to the chambers and said, look, you got to take advantage of this PPP program. And our financial institutions, they did such a phenomenal job of getting those applications processed. And where we stand now is kind of the first $350 billion that went just like that. I mean, into small businesses to stand people up. Uh, and we, you know, the second uh, tranche of that PPP loans, there's still about $100 billion left. Uh, and so our financial institutions have just done such a great job of getting that money into the hands of small businesses that need it. And I've talked to several of them over the last few weeks and they, everybody, a lot of the small businesses were very appreciative uh, of the way that program worked. Thank you for that. That's very helpful and encouraging to hear about how strong the position our banks are in. Thank you for that. Um, I'm looking at some of the questions that came in from our audience, and one of them is to ask an update about the Ohio Checkbook Program. Could you tell our listeners a little bit more about that? Sure, absolutely. Uh, this is the Ohio Checkbook is you can literally log on right now uh, if you weren't listening to the Zoom meeting, and you could find every expense with the state of Ohio on that system uh, through last week. So you can see exactly how we spend our money. And this is going to become more and more important uh, as our money is extremely valuable at this point. And you know, we got to spend it wisely on taxpayers and every dollar counts. And so taxpayers can hold us accountable for that spending through the Ohio checkbook. Uh, but that, that program was fairly expensive for us in the treasurer's office. And so we began an initiative almost a year and a half ago to take a look at our expenses in the treasurer's office and see how we could better serve the taxpayers and reduce our expense profile. And one of them was through reconfiguration of the Ohio checkbook. And so we're gonna have a tremendous cost savings there. We're working with Lieutenant Governor Husted's Innovate Ohio program. And I, I called up the Lieutenant Governor and said, there's no reason for us to have this duplicative service. He said, you're absolutely right, let's do this. So we're working hand in glove with the OBM, which is the Office of Budget Management at the state. Uh, they've been great partners on this and we are so excited. Here in July, we're gonna come out with a brand new look for the program. It's got some additional capabilities so that we can add some analytical tools on in the future, which is gonna be fantastic. And for the first time, the Ohio Checkbook is also gonna have the capability to have revenues in addition to just the expenditure. So it's a real upgrade of the product very excited about it, and uh, you're going to see the new look and feel here in just a few weeks. It's it's very very good. My team has done a great great job with it. Very nice, very nice. Um, I guess I want to close out with one additional question. Um, about a year ago, I think it was the um, state operating budget uh, approved your office's uh, use of uh, its. Results Ohio, um, a, it's a, a pay for success program. Um, can you just uh, elaborate uh, a little bit on that? Uh, describe the pay for success program and uh, you know, maybe, maybe where your office is in, in developing it. Absolutely, thank you for that question. I'm very excited about Results Ohio. It is the first of its kind in the country. And what we are doing here is creating a unique public private partnership where the state says, look, there are certain problems that we need to solve that we would like to have private industry work on and innovate on. And if you're able to come up with a better idea or a better program than what the state already has, we'll, we'll buy it, we'll pay for it. And so the way this works is we all agree, the governor's office and the General Assembly appropriate some money for a particular type of project. It might be something related to public health. You know, our public health system uh, probably needs an investment and update some innovation as we've just seen through the coronavirus uh, epidemic. And so they come up with an idea, they fund a pilot project, we all agree on the metrics up front, and at the end of the pilot project, we have a third party come in and measure the results. And if they get over that hurdle rate for the pilot project, the state agrees to buy, effectively buy that pilot project back from the private group typically a nonprofit that has started that and run that. And now we have a fantastic new program that works better than what we were already doing. 
So a way to encourage innovation, involve our private sector partners as well, uh, and really unleash the, the ideas of the private sector. And I'll tell you, I think so many times we are focused on the here and now, but we need to look forward to the future as to what our state can be. We have the ability to innovate. And this Results Ohio program allows us to do that in the public policy space. And I think you're also going to see tremendous opportunity for our state on a go forward basis. There's going to be an opportunity for us to gain from the readjustment of supply chains across the world as we reshore some manufacturing from China. I think we all agree we can't make our pharmaceuticals there exclusively anymore. And there's going to be opportunity there and also in our competition with other countries in terms of the airline industry. That's another place that we lead in, in Dayton and in, in uh, Southwest Ohio. GE has the most advanced airline engine in the world in Ohio. And we do research and development there. So we are a state of innovation and Results Ohio lets us use that innovation to the benefit of the public sector to help us create new, better programs, which I think are gonna be even more valuable now that every dollar is gonna count in this next budget. Well, that's exciting. Very exciting. Treasurer, thanks so much for your time today and, and a special shout out to your staff who worked with us. And I would be remiss if I didn't highlight our good friend, Bill Beagle and uh, helping us think through how to do this webinar. And uh, I'm looking forward to the time that Bill Beagle makes us cheesecake because he is probably one of the greatest cheesecake bakers of all time. <laughs> and so uh, until we can see each other again, face to face and your team, Blake and I just wanna say a great thank you to the treasurer's team and to you Treasurer Sprague for your leading the state and for joining us today. I hope uh, our CALFI friends that are listening enjoyed uh, the comments and the conversation. We miss you and uh, look forward to seeing all of you again. Everyone stay safe. Thank you, Treasurer Sprague. Thank you to your staff. Blake, great seeing you as well. You too. Thank you so much. Thank Thanks. you, Blake. Thanks, Leah. Look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye, everyone.